You want to be thrust in there. Non-stop editing, compositing, adding special effects, creating new special effects. Keep it very tight and very pacey. This actually turned out really nicely. I gotta blow up something big to start with. Once we finished shooting the film, um, I started editing it all together and, and assembling what was to be the first cut of the film. From my point of view, I was looking at it from where we can tighten it up and where we can shorten it because generally it was a little loose and shorter is generally better. We tightened almost every edit. Some scenes we shortened and some scenes we deleted yes. entirely. Lieutenant Dutan, assemble your boarding party. Yes, sir. Set weapons to stun. As a director, it's very difficult to cut back your own work. You sort of get very attached. It's good to have another set of eyes take a look at the project as a whole and to say, oh yeah, I reckon we can make a few trimmers here and there. <laughs> the difficulty with an effects uh, heavy film like this is how to get to that sense of pace in your editing when you don't have the effects. So we cut into the film some of the storyboards and that really helped. We were able to even put dialogue and music and sound. The tractor beam has been destroyed. At that stage, the CG guy started to supply us with some of the animatics. So then we get the, the animatics, send it over to Nick, Nick would go, oh, hang on, let's do this, this and this. So that'd come back and we'd change the animatic and we'd get a bit of time and throw in there. The opening shot, as it originally stood in the script, was basically two storyboards. It pans from the the ATR flying away from of the surface of Coruscant to the Star Destroyer shooting it. It was a fine shot, but it just... You want to be thrust in there. We came up with a couple of, of, of rough animatics for, for what we thought may or may not work. I mean, I think one of the first ones I had was a Corellian freighter and you have the ATR zoom up at the bottom of that, just turn in time, skim along the bottom and a TIE fighter slams into it. There were various versions chased through um, Coruscant itself, out through the atmosphere. That was just proving not quite right, didn't quite. Didn't, didn't quite flow. I think that was where the, the communication satellite came in at the front. I've got to blow up something big to start with. You, you've got to have a bang, get the audience in from the start. And then we think, okay, well we've got the animate just about where we want. Let's start dropping in the proper model. Okay, now we've got to split this down into layers and then render those out. Why you do it in layers is render efficiency. If later on you find out the lighting's not right, you can just rework a particular layer, which if you did it all at once, would really bog down the system, make the rendering take a lot longer. The computers were rendering solid 24-7. We had all four machines running out. We were running out of hard disk space. It became pretty clear that the sheer amount of work needed to be done on this film. The CG guys were going to need a bit of help to get this done in time. So whilst cutting the film together, I also started to do some of the compositing for the film, such as putting the Starfield backgrounds into the windows of the transport. <laughs> Luckily, when Nick had shot the film, he'd had the good sense to put little markers on the green screen on the sets when they were shooting the transport. And so when they were shaking the camera left and right, when they were being hit by laser blasts and things like that, I was able to use those tracker marks to motion track the Starfields to match the movement of the camera. So it all looked like it was really there. I knew we should have stolen a faster ship. Another major part of the film post-production which needed to get done was all of the compositing for the virtual sets for the Super Star Destroyer bridge. When Nick asked me to work on Broken Allegiance to do the compositing, at first I wasn't aware of the problems involved with keying DV footage. Because obviously we're working on limited budget and the camera that I own shoots in DV cam format, that was the format of choice that we used to shoot the film, but not having a, a huge amount of post-production knowledge at the time of shooting, we didn't find out until later that uh, DV cam as a format, because it's so highly compressed, is actually very, very difficult to, uh, to key. You get a very jagged edge, which a lot of the time is next to impossible to get rid of. So you'd end up having to resort to rotor splining, which is just a nightmare. But through using different techniques and different programs and three or four steps, we managed to get it all into After Effects looking pretty good. 
Get a tractor lock as soon as they're in range. The compositing basically involved background plates in the form of star fields. The star fields had to be animated so they were moving across. Separate background plates in the form of the bridge backgrounds. We then had a series of extras filmed against green screen which had to be keyed in. Foreground stuff being Vader and all the other guys. Then to all of that we had to add film grain and to the background we often added camera blur and finally color correction. So in the end it's actually turned out really nicely. Once we'd wrapped shooting the film we had a few leftover pyros that we ended up using in the studio or on location so went out into the backyard and set up a big black sheet and basically shot these explosions going off against black. We were then able to take those self-contained explosions and composite them into various elements of the film just to enhance the effects that were already there. One example is the interior of the transport uh, as Thor's ship has disabled the transport. I added some explosions to the set. Another thing I added was electricity, which was going across the boards. You'll see some of the electricity actually causes the explosions. And the other thing to make it look believable, I added an extra camera shake to the whole shot so that when it moved, the, the set and the explosions and the electricity all moved together in the same way so that it looked very believable. As far as the force lightning effect goes, I tried a few things with plugins and so forth, but they just didn't look realistic. They, they looked like a plug-in effect. So what we're able to do is uh, here in Melbourne, we went to a laboratory where they had a, a lightning generator. We were then able to take that footage and by keying out the black to composite those lightning arcs into the effects shot and just reposition them accordingly onto Ruan's hands. It took me at least a week working non-stop to get it right and then I decided that we needed to, to create some steam for when actually Thor's getting hit with the lightning that he starts to steam and smoke. To produce that effect I set up a, a, a coffee mug uh, against a black cloth and actually shot the steam rising off a boiling cup of, of coffee and then took that steam and positioned that over Thor in the shot so when he's actually getting hit he starts to fry and cook. Sometimes the you know, best looking effects are often the simplest. One part of the film that underwent many changes and evolutions was Darth Vader's scene on Coruscant. The scene was written into the film as a means of showing the audience the nature of Rowan and Callus, that they were in fact ruthless dark Jedi and would happily slaughter a bunch of officers and troopers if it meant making their escape in the stolen transport. As it was written in the script and also appeared on the storyboard, the scene was originally meant to be in a hangar bay on Coruscant. As the post-production of the film progressed, it seemed like a nice idea to have the scene take place on an exterior landing pad rather than an interior hangar bay. Some early animatics were done to test an aerial platform and proved very challenging to get it looking right, especially the camera angles when working with the pre-shot green screen footage. That's when Sci-Fi 3D resident Ian Foster came in and began working on the sequence. In a homage to the original Ralph Macquarie concept art done for Return of the Jedi, the initial idea was to have the landing pad where Rowan and Callus escape, part of the Emperor's Imperial Palace. A few animatic stills were done, but due to the amount of time it would have taken to get the shot looking right, we decided to go back to basics and just go with a generic building top landing pad with Coruscant traffic, much like we'd seen before in Phantom Menace. While the final shot was being worked on by Ian in the UK, a temporary shot was used in the original B trailer release. We finally received the shots from Ian, which although looked good, were rendered for daylight rather than sunset, so we added an atmospheric haze sunset lens flare and colour correction just to cement the shot together and to get it looking perfect. Corbin Thor's ship, now originally on the storyboard was this vague sort of shape and, and the design brief was mean. So I thought, okay, mean. Well, let's, let's go back and start. So it was leafing through the art of books, looking at some of the rejected designs, some of the Doug Chang designs, original Joe Johnson stuff. And spotted one of the designs originally for the Naboo Starfighter. I, I just liked it. It was a, a weird sort of um, stubby sort of thing, always with like pod racer engines on the side, sort of hot rod type thing. I thought, meeting hot rod, yeah, that's, that's worth a try. So I, I roughed up a version of that. Excitement. Sent it over to Nick, and he goes, mm, not mean enough. So I was trying to make it sort of look really, really mean, and ended up with this sort of the, the three nacelle type design with the central hull. 
The original version had a, a lot more spiky bits. You know, sort of, okay, okay, we've, we've got me. Let's, let's pull back a bit on me. So some of those bits got scrapped. We eventually sort of came up with a shape that we, we really liked. It was just nice in flight and looked really good. Looking at Thor's suit design and the, and the design elements there, you, you almost got an idea of sort of a rat or, or a hunting bird, something like that, something claw-like. So we then remodeled the central hull, in particular the cockpit, to be more beaky. And then we decided, okay, we've got to try and do the coloration and everything. And that again span out of the, the costume designs with a suit, the sort of coppery, browny sort of style. It took probably four or five months. So it ended up being quite a, a long design process on that one, but I like it. Um, still haven't given it a name yet, but I like it. Apart from the CG effects that Agent Cameron were working on for the film, I needed to get together a team of people who could create the lightsaber effects for the film. Via the fan film forums on the internet, I was able to get in contact with a couple of guys, one who lives in France, who was able to take on about a third of the lightsaber effects work, and another guy who lives in Canberra here in Australia to take on the other third of effects work, and, and I completed the rest. <laughs> When they shot on location with the Stormtrooper uniforms, unfortunately one of the Stormtrooper's uniforms was a little bit yellow. I had this theory that uh, his mother had, uh, had not quite got the washing done properly, so I decided we needed to bleach it. What that meant in practice, of course, was to manually cut around the edge of the Stormtrooper and remove the yellow colour. I think it worked really well, but it took forever. Most complicated shot probably would have been the landing of Corbain Thor's starship on Bethowie. We had to generate a mat for the foreground leaves so the foreground leaves could be brought in front of Thor's ship as it's coming over the top. And of course you can see the engine, so you need an engine flare in there. We had the original background plate, which was then colour corrected. We had the raw CG element, a reflection pass through the window, colour corrected it, added a shadow and some haze, added little particle jets for the engines, we then decided it really needed a bit of interaction with the ground. So first I decided to blur underneath the ship to make it look like a heat shimmer as the ship was landing. Next I added some dust particles uh, underneath the ship as if the exhaust was blowing up the dust from underneath and then blurred them just so they looked a little more natural. In the end, all of that blood, sweat and tears I think came into a a collaborative effort that, that really worked right at the last moment. So, so everyone in the end I think could be proud of it, even though we nearly murdered one another. My day job is editing, but this pushed me. I ended up doing a lot of stuff that I've never done before. When do you get the opportunity to composite star fields into windows, and laser bolts coming out of spaceships, adding explosions onto sets? It was pretty cool. And I think the rewards were well worth it. Learned new techniques and new skills, developed a good style, and was afforded a good deal of creative freedom. For what was a fan film that was done on a very big scale. I think the end result is great, and it's on my show reel, so <laughs> that says it. In the end, it was the enthusiasm and hard work of a small group of people who put in a lot of hours and effort on the post-production of this film, it really brought us home at the end of the day, and produced a result that we can all be really proud of.